All right, well, my name is Tania Fonseca again, and I'm the events coordinator for Latino Heritage Month Committee. And it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. Dr. Carlos Munoz is one of the founders of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, an academic pioneer in Chicano, Latino, and ethnic studies. After four decades in teaching in higher education, he is nationally recognized as a political scientist, historian, and public intellectual in the areas of racial politics, diversity, immigration, Civil and Human Rights and Affirmative Action. His book, Youth Identity Power, the Chicano Movement, was a key resource for the PBS television series, Chicano History of the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement. Dr. Munoz was the founding chair of the first Chicano Studies Department in the nation and the founding chair of the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies. He currently serves as a professor of emeritus in the Department of Ethnic Studies in the University of California, Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carlos Munoz. Gracias, gracias. <laughs> Buenas noches. ¿Cómo estamos? Llenos de vida y música y comida. <laughs> anyway, good evening to translate. I just said, hi, you all. How you doing? Um, you're full of music and food and, and joy. Uh, it's always joyful to me when I'm asked to come, sp or go speak rather, to uh, an event that is organized by Latino, Latina students in particular. Of course, staff are okay, pero, you know, uh, los importantes, the important ones are the students in the audience. And uh, uh, I, I'm always, uh, um, you know, I will be mindful of that. Uh, I would like to thank uh, el señor compañero, De la vida, Aurelio Curvelo, and the, uh, the Latino Heritage Committee for inviting me to speak tonight. And also those folks who were kind enough to co sponsor the event with enough money. Yeah? Uh, in case you may not know, uh, the origins of the Hispanic Heritage Month or Latino Heritage Month, uh, which whatever your choice is to call it, uh, goes back to the year 1968, the year when Mexican-American students of my generation founded the Chicano Civil Rights Movement. And one of our first actions was to demand that the U.S. Congress and the President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson, acknowledge the historic contributions of Mexican-Americans uh, and other Latinos that have uh, been made, or that they have made uh, historically in times of war and peace. In particular, we wanted to celebrate uh, our cultural traditions, but most importantly, to celebrate the legacies of struggle, okay? Uh, the struggle that our ancestors have waged historically in this part of the world for social justice and uh, freedom. And we wanted to start the, the celebrations on the 15th of the month, 15th of September. Anybody know why? Viva Mexico! That's the day in 1810, a little bit over 200 years ago, that, the, uh, that a Catholic priest by the name of Miguel Hidalgo rang the bell in Dolores, Guanajuato, calling for the revolution against the Spanish Empire, and also for the end to slavery. Uh, and uh, so this is why we thought September 15th would be a good, good day. So therefore, it overlaps into October, right? So you can celebrate some more until the, uh, until the 16th, which is tomorrow, right? Uh, so ahí vamos. So um, prior to the... Uh, to that particular uh, uh, historical event of starting this particular monthly celebration every year, uh, we were an invisible people. Uh, Mexican Americans were invisible to uh, the majority of Americans. Uh, Puerto Ricans were invisible to the majority of, of Americans. Uh, Cuban Americans, was más o menos, you know, they were a smaller, smaller percentage of the population. Back in those days, in the 60s, there were only three visible Latino populations. The Mexicans were the dominant ones. 
uh, Boricuas were next, and then, and then Cubanos. Now, of course, it's a whole different world, eh? Uh, we have now, in the midst of all of our population, Latino population, we have 17 distinct eh, uh, peoples from the, all the nations of the Americas, plus uh, the islands, uh, you know, uh, as well, you know, Cuba and Puerto Rico and, and the Bahamas and all those other, all those other islands. So there's 17 flags that uh, uh, maybe would be waved uh, at every celebration. And um, so again, uh, it's a whole different world. But to go back to the 60s, in particular to my particular experience, why am I the man I am today? Why am I a scholar activist? Why am I a public intellectual? Because it comes from my participation in a very historic moment in our U.S. history, and that is to be part of a, of a very uh, significant civil rights movement that, uh, like the one in the South that was led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, had an impact on the society, and most importantly, opened the doors to these institutions. Uh, all these white institutions uh, were all white back then. I mean, uh, we weren't uh, visible at all in, in them. And uh, now we go through the, uh, the country, and uh, yeah, there may not be as many as we would like, but you can look at you here tonight, okay? But uh, back then, when I was a student, the only reason why I got into college, because I was a Vietnam War era veteran on the GI Bill. And at that time in history, in the 1960s, those are the only ones that were able to get in. Uh, there were no women to speak up, except in the private Catholic universities and colleges, just the exception. But in terms of public education, there were very few women. Uh, because at that time, uh, contrast to today, uh, all the veterans were, were men. Now, of course, we have men and women veterans because women are now uh, able to go into the military as soldiers, not just as nurses, as was the case in the past. So um, uh, I grew up uh, poor. Like the majority of those of us who started the, the, the movement, we were all poor children of working class, poor immigrants from Mexico. Uh, and uh, we uh, had you know, different kinds of experiences here and there, but all of our experiences combined, are collectively speaking, contributed to our politicization or radicalization, if I can put it that way. And so as one of the founders and leaders of that movement, uh, I have always maintained that we must place our struggle and these particular cultural celebrations in the context of the civil and human rights, social justice, uh, 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 peace agenda, okay? Because what we're talking about in the final analysis, which started back in the 60s and continues today, we're talking about or should be talking about the quest for an authentic, multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural democracy. The one we got now, it's not that. So uh, I have been uh, uh, shaped in particular, well, by, by three particular uh, uh, key uh, uh, things. One of us growing up poor uh, in a segregated uh, barrio in El Paso, Texas. Uh, it was, you know, all Mexicans in one side of town and all whites on the other side, that kind of a thing, you know. The same thing that happened in the South for African Americans happened to us in the Southwest. And it shaped my particular perspective in terms of you know, posing the question in my young mind, por qué? Why? Why is it when I go across town, things are better over there? Hmm? Why is it that we have to go to the theater, the movies, see movies in, in this part of town and not on that part of town? Why can't we not go to the swimming pools along with white youth? That kind of question, you know what I mean? And mind you, being young, pues, you know, no sabemos, we don't know. We don't know the answers. So then, uh, in spite of the fact that I grew up in that particular situation that uh, was full of injustice, uh, I was still a very patriotic American because the public schools did a great job of programming us, okay, into, the, into believing the myth of democracy, okay? So what did I do, like all of us and some, some people, young people today still do, we uh, joined the Army, the Marines, or whatever, to you know, prove our patriotism, hoping that if we served this country in the military, went to war and died in the war, we would come back either alive or in caskets, but with respect, with acceptance that we were Americans. It didn't happen that way, though. 
It didn't happen that way. It didn't happen that way. In all the wars that we fought, we've been in every single war that this country has fought, beginning with the Civil War even, okay, uh, until, until now. But so we were, we were angry uh, veterans, those of us that were fortunate enough to be in college back in the 60s. So we decided to make this particular, uh, to make a, a revolution uh, for our particular social justice and to open the doors to higher education because at that time they were not open at all for the most part. One of the things that we did uh, uh, that led to my second, my second uh, experience was again, uh, uh, joined the military like I said. And then in the military, I uh, was fortunate enough because I was able to know how to type. You know, I learned how to type in, in high school because when I was going to high school, there was a very vulgar uh, racist tracking system. If you were black or brown and you were a, kid, a young guy, you got put into the industrial arts major, okay? Um, wood shop, auto mechanics. We were not given the academic uh, curriculum because it was felt that we were intellectually inferior, okay? That's what the mindset was at that time. If you were a young woman, a young Mexican woman or a black woman, you got put into home economics or uh, if you were lucky, business major, okay? To learn how to be a secretary, clerical type of person about home economics because you were gonna be, they thought you were gonna be a maid. That's all you were good for, the thinking was back then, in my day, in my, in my, of my youth. So anyway, the good thing that happened to me was that my, my white counselor asked me, what does your father do for, for a living? I said, well, he works with his hands, labor, hard labor. And she says to me, that is a very, very honorable profession. You should follow in your father's footsteps. So what I didn't know at that time, time being, you know, I was only 15 years old, around there, 14. I go home, Mama, Pa, guess what? So what? Yeah, um, I'm going to follow in your footsteps. What? Man, he got angry. What the hell are you talking about? You go and tell that so-and-so, I won't repeat his words, so and so that I want you to be able to graduate from high school, he had a fifth grade education, and work with a pencil, not a pick and shovel. Hmm? Was I boy the next day. Ma'am, uh, my father doesn't want me to walk, to, uh, to walk in his footsteps or follow his footsteps. So he wants me to work with a pencil. So she thought, hmm. Chipa was thinking, ah, cabrón, what do I do now? Or translated, she was probably thinking, gee whiz, what am I going to do now with this Mexican kid, you know? So she says, pencil, hmm, okay, I'm going to give you a business major. Okay, sounds cool. And you can be, learn how to be a youth, a youth used car salesman. All right. So I got into business major, and I go to class, all these girls, right? Yeah, I was a happy kid. Complain? Nah. Tracking system? Nah. Of course, I didn't know there was one. So I learned how to type. Now that came in handy when I went into the military. I was trained as a soldier. I was trained to be a killer, like all soldiers are. And I was ready to go to the battlefront and give up my life for this country. But because I knew how to type, I wound up in Army Intelligence. Hijo, that sounds pretty impressive, huh? Army Intelligence, wow, you smart Mexican. But that's not what it was. I learned that uh, intelligence in the army is an oxymoron. You all know what an oxymoron is? Eh? When you catch the word moron, <laughs> oxymoron, that gives you an idea. Dumb, it can be, you know, it's kind of contradictory because in reality the people are too smart in army intelligence, as we know by all the fiascos that our, that our army intel, our, our CIA and all these people make every single day they're doing a fiasco. Una pendejada, as we say in Spanish. So anyway, uh, as, as a, a, a member of the Korean military advisory group, I was sent to South Korea just before Vietnam started. And uh, I witnessed a coup d'etat. You all know what a coup d'etat is, right? If you don't know, it's a fancy French term for the overthrow of a democratic government, all right? So the Korean military, who were trained here in this country at war colleges and all that, put together this plan to have a coup d'etat with the blessing 
of one of my heroes at the time by the name of President John F. Kennedy okay? and the U.S. government. It was an undercover war. Nobody knew about it in Vietnam to start, you know, and also the coup d'etat. So the coup d'etat I witnessed, and I, said, and I began, it was my next, my next episode of prender el foco, you know, uh, that, that the light is, 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 is turned on in my brain. And I started thinking critically again, and I asked another question. Okay, don't forget, I asked a question that was a kid, right? Por qué? I asked another question. If I am an American soldier serving my country to defend democracy at home and here in South Korea, why am I being ordered not to intervene or stop the coup d'etat, instead to let it happen? And I said, hmm, something is not rotten in Denmark, as Shakespeare said. Something is rotten in Washington, D.C. Eh? So there's my next step in my political cessation and radical. You see? So when I got out of the army, oh, by the way, before that, I was asked to be, go to Vietnam to be with the, one of the first military advisors in Vietnam because nobody knew about Vietnam at that time, and I refused. And it was my first time in jail. I had to do it. I got, I got what is called Article 15, and I was uh, put on house arrest. They didn't have a prison nearby, so they put me in house arrest. But, but that's okay. It's been, you know, had I gone to Nam, I probably would have, I wouldn't be here probably, you know. So anyway, the point is that after I got out, I joined the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and I started marching. I became an activist, okay, and I happens to still be. So the, that's the second, the third experience that I went through that made me the man I am today is in 1968 as well. Uh, we were sitting together, some of us veterans and, and students, and we started talking about what is the problem? Why is it that we we are all you know activists in the anti-war movement, activists in the farm worker movement, activists in the Southern Civil Rights Movement, but what about in our own backyard, in our barrios, in our own backyard? Nothing's happening there. You know, things continue to happen as they have always happened. You know, apathy, op oppression, and all that. So that was the next step. We, we said, we're going to have our own revolution. So we started our own movement. So that's what we did. Started the Chicano Civil Rights Movement. We call it the Chicano Movement for short. And the first action that we did after, of course, you know, demanding the Hispanic Month, Latino Month, was to uh, uh, stage and organize nonviolent high school student protest in segregated East Los Angeles, California. And that's what kicked off our civil rights movement, really, in terms of overall the Southwest and the Midwest. And uh, so uh, 10,000 students and their families, you know, and, and teachers and staff, we didn't have any, but there were white teachers and staff, that, and black teachers and staff, and together with African American students in Southern, South Central Los Angeles who walked out in solidarity uh, with us, uh, we, we uh, got the headlines that we had never gotten before. They didn't know what to do with those people in power. What is it? We're already dealing with the blacks, you know, with, uh, with all the, you know, King, Dr. King's, Malcolm X, and all those people. Now we got them to deal with. You know, they didn't like that. So what happened then, after about two months later, after we had these successful walkouts demanding the end to racism in the schools, uh, demanding the end of, uh, of, of uh, poor education, demanding quality education, and also demanding things like enchiladas in the, in the, uh, in, you know, uh, in, the in the cafeteria, you know, just not to, not to forget about food. But uh, uh, so then uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, one morning, I was a first year graduate student and I was working on my research paper that I was doing the next day. And when you're an activist, you know, you've got to really kind of, you know, uh, have to work hard uh, sometimes to meet the deadlines. And uh, there was a knock on the door, and I go to the door, and I was in my calzones, you know, my, uh, my T-shirt, my under was a hot night, and I was working at the typewriter in the kitchen. Uh, I had a stack of books there on the, table, the kitchen table. I go to the door, bang! It, before I even opened it, it was crash, came crashing down on me. The, 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 the riot squad, whatever the police were calling, they got all their helmets, and they got on the bullet probe vest, came in with the guns drawn, pointed at my head. I said, oh, gee. I didn't know what to say. I was just kind of shocked, you know. And uh, so they said, I, you're under arrest. Uh, I said, why? Uh, Never mind why. You know, where's your, where's your guns? Where's your guns? I said, guns? I haven't had a gun since I was in, in the U.S. Army. 
And uh, so they went and searched the house for guns and weapons, and they couldn't find any weapons of mass destruction, in quote. <laughs> so they go to the kitchen and find these books. And what, guess what the books were about? Communism. Karl Marx, Leon Trotsky, eh? uh, all these evil, these devils, okay? Because I was taking a seminar on international communism from an anti-communist professor, and I didn't know anything about communism, so I wanted to learn about it. He said, what's going on? What is, what's so bad about communism? And this is what I was doing a paper on. So the cops go to the kitchen and say, ah, oh, they yell out, we got, the, we got the proof, we got this guy where we want him, you know? This damn commie, we're gonna get him. So anyway, make a long story short, I wound up in prison. Became a political prisoner in our democracy. So there I am in a prison cell with people who were, had, who were there, who had killed somebody, committed murder, who had committed armed robbery, who had committed rape, who had been uh, drug lords. There I was with these guys. Huh? And they asked me, what, what did you do, what did you do, man? I bet, I bet, what did you do? Well, I organized nonviolent student protest. <laughs> wow, you know, they didn't believe me. Yeah, they didn't. They thought I was an undercover cop trying to get the goods on them. So I had to defend myself a couple of times, and I finally said, look, this is ridiculous. I said, man, if I was a cop, do you think I would tell you that story? I would tell you that I killed somebody like you did. Right? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so then he says, well, why, 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 why are you here then? And I said, and I thought about it. You know, I can't, I can't tell you in a few words. I got to write a book about it. And that's the book that is out there. That's the book that I wrote. I think it's out there, right? It's supposed to be out there. But anyway, uh, it's entitled uh, Youth Identity Power, the Chicano Movement. The story about why it was that my generation decided to put together this particular movement. One of the things that we did uh, also in the Chicano movement is organize our own political party, our own independent political party we call La Raza Unida. Contrary to right-wing people, La Raza doesn't mean just race to us. It's, it's the people. La Raza means the people. It's not a racist term. It's what we call our political party. But uh, the reason, like all third parties in this country, we, the reason we didn't get any worse because, you know, we didn't have access to mass media, or we didn't have, we couldn't raise the millions of dollars that it takes to, to, to a campaign in our so-called democracy. Have you ever wondered about that? If we live in a democracy, why does, it call, why does it cost millions of dollars to run for political office? Why? It shouldn't be that way, huh? That means it leaves a lot of, it leaves a lot of people out. It leaves, it, only the rich can run for political, only the rich can be, can be president. Yes, Obama is rich, okay? All presidents are rich. So, Ever since then, I have been speaking truth to power. I have been working in different ways here in our country and in the third world countries to push together, to put together and push hard on making uh, social justice and democracy a fact of life in our so-called dem democracies. And so today, as an old man, in quote, I am as committed as ever to do that. And as a scholar, I have to also do that because I believe that scholarship and scholars should not just stay in the ivory tower of the academy. We have the responsibility because of our knowledge, because of our research, to become part of the real world out there, to change it for the better. Not just to publish books, to get tenure, and get professorships and all that. I never believed in that. Because they, that, that comes anyway, if you are good, you know? If you're doing good quality scholarship anyway. So what I have to do today is, like I tell my students every time I teach, knowledge is painful. Knowledge is wonderful. To, you uncover new things, new facts, new realities. But it's also painful because it makes you question what you believe in. And no doubt some of you believe in a myth of democracy, okay? It's not your fault. It's the ed your education's fault. We have to restructure our educational system, but that's another topic for another day. For now, let me tell you what's going on today. Uh, way back in the 60s, what we would say was happening in our country 
was, not, was ignored, you know? They thought we were just a bunch of radicals, you know, a bunch of communists, revolutionaries. And now, you can't help but see the reality because it's there, it's there. We don't have a dictator to oppose, as is the case is in Arab nations today or Latin American nations, some of them, some of them where people are demanding a real democracy. But it can be said, and what I have learned from my political participation is that we do have what I call a lesser of two evils, corporate party, two-party dictatorship. In the final analysis, it doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat or Republican. They both are committed to the perpetuation of maintaining this nation of ours as an empire, as the world's most powerful military empire. It used to be the most powerful economic and military empire, but China has overtaken the economic part. Okay? And now all we have now is a military dic dictatorship or empire. We have 737 military bases right now, this very minute, all over the world, with American soldiers stationed there, ready to be sent into war wherever it's going on. There are secret wars going on right now we don't even know about. There are bombings. President Obama has, has ordered bombings to, in Libya, okay, and other parts of the world. In Somalia is the last one now, and now that's one going on right now. But I'll talk more about that later on. So the ele elections that we all witness in terms of state and federal, not necessarily local as much, okay, but state and federal, are, are, are uh, you know, they, they're, they're really, they're uh, being uh, dominated or they're being uh, run by the, those who rule, this two-party dictatorship I speak of. We don't have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people as would be the case in a real democracy, okay? As Abraham Lincoln made it clear way back when he was president, that's what we should have. We have a democracy, we have a, a government rather, that is controlled by what I call the military corporate prison complex. Best to redefine it from what, di what President Eisenhower said. Some of you remember President Eisenhower, you might have studied it, you might have learned it. President Eisenhower was a Republican, by the way, as he, as he went out of office, warned this country of ours that there was an industrial military complex that needed to be controlled. Well, now we have what I call a military corporate prison complex that needs to be controlled because it, had, it, it holds power all of us. We've got to stop that. And we've got to come up with a new politics that's going to do that eventually. So this is why President Obama, is, he might be well-meaning, and I gave, him the, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. He's a great guy, I love the guy, you know, charismatic, one of the most intelligent presidents, if not the most intelligent president we've ever had. I love his family, you know, beautiful wife, children, wow. And he plays basketball. And I wish I played basketball with him. But uh, he's president of the U.S. empire. And as president of the U.S. empire, he continues a war that Bush started in Iraq and he makes his own war against Afghanistan. And uh, right now, he is planning war against Pakistan, Iran, and other sovereign nations who don't have, you know, weapons of mass destruction, as was the case with Iraq. This is why President Obama bailed out Wall Street, the banks, and other financial corporations that are responsible for the economic crisis our nation faces today. Why some of you have family, if not yourselves, who are out of jobs, out of homes. You know? Uh, this is why. Because the poor were not bailed out, the working class was not bailed out, and even the middle class was not bailed out. Only the 1% were bailed out. The 99% were not. So this is why we have a crisis in higher education that is characterized by budget cuts and restructuring process that I label the process of the privatization of public education. My own university, University of California, Berkeley, number one university in, in the world, I understand, public university, is now only funded by one-third of state funds. One-third, actually 11% now, of all the funding 
you know, comes from uh, private corporate sources. So the corporation is controlling more and more these institutions of ours in, in higher education. This is why there's an occupation of, on Wall Street in New York taking place and why occupations throughout the country are also taking place in solidarity. And I was so happy to see, where is that paper? I got a paper here somewhere. I was so happy to pick up your school paper today, your school paper, front page, Iowa State occupied. You know? Wow. So I hope some of you are here that were there in the occupation, but that is fantastic. You know, I never thought that I would go to Iowa State and hear about them joining the occupation movement. Right, right on. That made me happy. That made my day. Actually, you made my day. Okay? I, you know, you made my day. Your presence here, you know, reflects that uh, you are committed to finding out the truth of what's going on in your nation, in your society. So, uh, what do we do? Where do we go? And most importantly, how does diversity fit into all of this, you know? Uh, as you know, uh, you're here because th there's a diversity program on campus, multicultural program, right? You have, uh, you have an office uh, that, that sponsors these events. And uh, it's all over the place because uh, people now want to be able to say, yeah, well, we have, a, we have diversity. And, uh, but, but the by same token, however, as I will say, talk about now, is that we have to redefine the diversity we have now in, in, a, in a different, to make a different way, to make it look a different, uh, take a different path. So we are witnessing our nation's domestic and foreign policy disasters, but we're also witnessing the most profound demographic revolution in our nation's history. The coloring of America is well underway, whether some people like it or not. Tea Party people or whoever they want, get, get, it's too bad. Ni modo, I, I tell them. You're stuck with it, man. We have a society now that is multiracial, multicultural, multiethnic. And this is why uh, we need to look at what that means. In particular, uh, the explosion of people, of Latino people. Latinos are leading that particular demographic revolution, and this is what is scaring a lot of people uh, in our country, especially the white supremacists among us, the right-wing uh, uh, Tea Party people that uh, feel threatened by the presence of more Latinos. So we need to uh, see diversity as, as a way toward making our democracy an authentic one. Right now it's a limited one. A democracy that will prioritize our nation's youth and defines education as a human right. You students here today, you have a human right to be here. You should not have to be here because you have to be the brightest of them all. You know, and, and great students that you are. That's great, I'm proud of you for doing that. But you should have to just be here. We have the, right, the human right to be here. We have to have a democracy that defines health as a human right. We have to have a democracy that prioritizes the welfare of all its workers, documented or undocumented, by defining those rights as human rights. We need a democracy that declares war on poverty and not against sovereign nations that have nothing to do with terrorism. So we need a democracy that does not support dictatorships throughout the world, but a democracy that will not just foc focus on the, on the vote as the ideal of that democracy but they will establish a level playing field for all Americans, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation. But we can't get there right now because regretfully we are in the midst of a, of a politics of racial and ethnic conflict that permeates our society as a whole. And uh, racism continues to be alive and well. Some of us may not see it. A lot of us don't want to see it. A lot of us just want to put it under, under the carpet, sweep it under the carpet, no, but it's there. It's there. And uh, uh, one of my heroes, by the name of W.B. Du Bois, African-American, great intellectual and activist, talked about the color line in the 20th century. So tonight, I talk about the multi-color line in the 21st century, okay? Because that means that we no longer are, even if we wanted to, we no longer remain tight to what used to be a black and white paradigm. That's changed. 
we now must talk about a multiracial paradigm. So racism continues to matter, not just to, to African Americans, but it matters to Latino, Latinas, it matters to Asians, it matters to American Indians, and since 9-11, it matters to American Muslims and Sikh or Punjabi people. So we must understand that we must do something to, uh, to uh, co collectively get together to change things. So Latinos have their responsibility. We, we represent everybody, okay? Uh, we think still today a lot of times that we are just part Spanish and part Indian, right? In our own families, mestizo. Mestizo is defined, makes sure defined as, bueno, indígena y español, pero más español que todo. Okay? No, 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 no digas que eres indio. My parents just say, don't tell people that you're Indian. You're Spanish. You know, our, our motherland is Spain. Oh, wow. And you know why that's the case? Because our parents don't know any better, or did not know any better. Those who must not know, our grandparents especially. Because the Spanish did a great job of colonizing their minds in the 300 years that they colonized Mexico and, and Latin America as a whole. So this is why, why the white, uh, you know, white uh, identity is so looked at superior and why today uh, uh, most Latinos identify as white. Every baby that's born, no matter how dark, it's white. God, I used to get it. When all my five kids were born, I was always on the war path at the hospital. You know, he is not white, or she's not white, you know? Well, what are they? Well, I guess for lack of a better, if you want to go by color, we're brown. <laughs> but we're also black, you know? We're also, we come in all colors. So in reality, as I went about my, my research as a young scholar, beyond what I just mentioned, is that I research our African roots. We, as Latinos, Latinas, are part of the African diaspora. Why? Because Africans got to Latin America long before Columbus, okay? Long before Columbus, there's evidence. The evidence, for the most part, can be found or seen, you can't miss it, big, bolder sculptures, Olmeca heads, they're called. The Olmeca civilization was the first major civilization of the Americas that emerged in Veracruz, Mexico, okay? And you look at those, those sculptures, those, you know, you can, you can internet, you can Google, Google them, Olmeca heads, and you see the face of Africa. Yes, you do. But some people don't want to see the face of Africa. So, well, that's just an ugly indigenous person, in quote, you know. They don't, want to, they don't want to admit it. But it's difficult for them to admit it. But we're all also part Asian. We've got Af Asian roots because the Spaniards not only took Africans, African slaves to Latin America, all over Latin America, they went to Veracruz, Mexico, by the way, the African slaves. Okay? But they also brought Filipino and Chinese slaves to Mexico. So there you are. And of course, we are Europe, part European también, you know. The conquistadores were Europeans. And then later on, there were European immigrants that came in later on uh, to parts of Latin America. So we represent religiously, well, yeah, most of us are Catholic, but we have in our midst Jews who were welcomed with open arms uh, after the Inquisition took place in Spain. Okay? There's a lot of Mexican Jews walking around. We have Arab Muslim roots as well. I had an uncle by the name of Nasser, Egyptian, you know, Muslim name. Uh, and I had an uncle who looked like an African American and he came over to live over here too. I probably have a Chino somewhere too, but I don't know yet. Because that was my nickname growing up in the barrio, El Chino. So I don't <laughs> Anyway, so the point is that we represent everybody. We even got a lot of Irish Mexicans around. You know anybody Irish here tonight? You know what you know about the Irish San Patricio, the San Patricio you know about the San Patricio Brigade? the St. Patrick Brigade during the war against Mexico that the U.S. Empire waged to take away half of the Mexican territory, there were, there were a group of, of, of Irish, Irish uh, soldiers, immigrants from Ireland who were, were encouraged to join the U.S. cavalry to become citizens. Sound familiar? And so they went to war against the Mexicans, right? And when they were captured Mexican soldiers or Mexican soldiers were captured, sure they, am, they got along great, you know? <laughs> And the Irish would talk to you, wow, man, I like these people. 
They're just like us. They're Catholic. They like to drink beer. They're family or they love family. They're family oriented. They prioritize family like we do. We're on the wrong side. So they didn't jump ship because they weren't sailors. They jumped horses. They became part of the Mexican army. And to this day, they are considered one of the most important heroes in Mexican history in Mexico. I have a cousin by the name of Carlos O'Reilly, by the way. They don't, they don't really so again, we have, we have this particular reality. So we have to understand that and, and, and accept it and embrace it. And knowing full well that as you young people in particular develop into leaders, that you not only have the responsibility to represent your communities, but you also have the responsibility to represent all of us. And that you have to become the bridge builders, the kind of leader that is going to you know, build coalitions that are going to work. Not just symbolic ones, but ones that are going to work. But before we get to that point, uh, you have to deal with what's happening now in terms of white supremacist actions against immigrants. We not only have wars going on in the Middle East and other parts of Latin America, in Mexico, a war between the cartels and the Mexican army, we got a war going on right here against immigrants being waged by the US government, in particular being waged by ICE, which uh, is the agency of the Homeland Security responsible for the enforcement of immigration laws, who right this very minute somewhere nearby or far away, not too far away, are terrorizing an undocumented family. That's going on with the blessing of President Obama. That's not right. In Alabama, or rather Arizona, you know, the first laws came into play and they're now being enforced that I call brown profiling uh, laws. Police have the right to stop you and ask you for documents. If you don't have them, you are shackled, arrested like a criminal because you have been criminalized. It is now a felony not to have papers in Arizona. It is now a felony not to have papers in Georgia. It is now a felony not to have papers in Alabama. And there's other states in the union that, that the people on the right wing, Tea Party people are trying to also do the same thing. And uh, in Alabama, it's really the most uh, draconian law because there in Alabama, they are, they are ordering teachers in the classroom to identify kids who are either documented or children of undocumented parents. So you know what's happening in Alabama? Kids are not going to school. The children are barricading themselves in their little one room homes, apartments, closing the uh, window shades and everything because they're afraid to go out and be captured by ICE. So that's what's going on. And uh, I have a lot more to say about that, but I don't want to have time for us to have a little dialogue, some Q&A, questions and answers. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run down toward my conclusion here. Um, so we need to understand and, and uh, deal with that reality of terrorism in our own society. Uh, not to mention the war going on against our youth, you know, black and brown youth in particular, African American, Latino youth right now. Police are looking at them as someone to harass, and, and they're all in gangs, you know, or want to be gangs. Gang injunctions are being put into play here and there, okay? And what, what they fail to realize, I was, a, I was in gangs when I was growing up because I was on the streets. My mother died when I was three. And the reason gangs exist is because families don't exist on the one hand, because the, also the environment is, is it pits kids against each other, okay? But it's not an inherent cultural trait that some people like to think it is. And the, the, these gangs would not be around if we had a budget at the federal and state and local levels that would provide for youth programs, okay? Not just in sports, soccer, baseball, football, and all that, but in art, in music, in everything that children are interested in to, to encourage them to be creative, to encourage them to be critical thinkers. But instead, what are most states in the Union doing? In my own state of California, they're building more prisons. There's affirmative action in the prisons. It's the only institution, well, next to the military too, 
two institutions that have affirmative action, where we are as Latinos and African Americans overrepresented. We sure as heck are not overrepresented in these institutions, are we? We remain underrepresented in our education. So that's another example of a myth of democracy. The U.S.-Mexico border is a war zone now, thanks to President, not a Republican, but Democratic President Clinton, the good guy. People think, oh, Clinton was a good guy. Well, like John F. Kennedy, he had his problems. He had his baggage. Liberals are the same as Republican conservatives and when it comes right down to it. So Clinton you know, made the, made the uh, border a war zone. And uh, Bush continued it, maintained it. But President Obama has gone beyond Clinton and Bush. Not only does he maintain the, board, the, the, the big fence that's there now, but he militarized it even more. The Border Patrol has now become, next to the FBI, the second most endowed money-wise agency of the U.S. government. He also has authorized sending U.S. troops. There are now U.S. troops in Mexico, in Mexico, 400 of them to be military advisors for the Mexican army. Does that sound like Vietnam or does that sound like Middle East and so forth? That's not good. Not to mention that he's also appropriated, and Congress has approved, uh, millions of dollars to the Mexican government to use in that war. What Obama and the Congress should be doing is fighting the situation here at home because we are responsible here, not you and I, but our, our country because drugs, this is where all the drugs are being sold. We have the highest you know, ratio of drug purchase in the world, the most drug addicts in the world. And weapons, we are the number one nation in the world that supplies weapons to anybody who wants to make war. The drug cartels in Mexico are using American weapons that they're being bought this very day, this very hour, in some of those gun shops in our communities. That's what the problem is, not Mexico. Well, Mexico, the problem is because the war is there. Now, Samuel Huntington, I mentioned right wing, white supremacist. Well, guess what? A very reputable academic political scientist in particular, by the name of Samuel Huntington at Harvard University, he has passed away, may he not rest in peace, argued in his books, The Clash of Civilizations, one of them, and the other book, Who Are We? The Challenges of America to America's National Identity, that Latinos, he says in his books, Latinos are the most serious threat to the Eurocentric identity and culture, that our nation will lose its single national language and its core WASP culture because of the Latino presence. You all know what the WASP culture is, right? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. In his words, you don't want to accept my words, it's cool, but in his words, in this new era, the single most immediate and most serious challenge to America's traditional identity and border security comes from the immense and continuing immigration from Latin America, especially from Mexico. Well, you didn't say Mexico, Mexico, end quote. Ahí está. Now, another, another battleground is affirmative action. I'm pleased to learn since my visit here, since I arrived, that you have affirmative action here. That's wonderful. You gotta fight to maintain it. Uh, but we lost it in California back in uh, 1996 to an election, a proposition, proposition called 209 that was generated. And by the way, the, the person who led the fight for the end of, uh, end of affirmative action in California is an African American. He was a regent at the University of California. And even adding more insult to injury, that man was a product of affirmative action. He got the opportunity to become a very, very uh, 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 profitable uh, businessman because of affirmative action. Then he turns around and decides that it's not a good deal for other people. Uh, other states, Texas, Michigan, uh, the, there's watered water down affirmative action. And the, the whole anti-affirmative action movement in this country is predicated on the belief that there are racial preferences, that affirmative action is a racial preference criteria for admissions, and that uh, uh, it, it, 
that they cannot be tolerated. What people don't talk about in terms of racial preferences or they neglect to accept and acknowledge the historical fact that there has been racial preferences, but there have been white racial preferences since the founding of our republic because our so-called founding fathers were white supremacist slave owners. That's where it all started. So there's white privilege. Now, you happen to be white. Don't take it personal. It's not your fault, okay? But that's the reality of these institutions, that it's very, very difficult for students of color to get equality in terms of, when you do get into the university, it happened to me, it probably happens to you, you looked at affirmative act. Oh, you're not really, you're not really a, uh, a good student, you know? You're here, you're here because you're, you're African-American or because you're Latino, Latina, because we have to admit you. Puro pedo in Spanish means in English, that is a lie. You're here because you deserve to be here, because you met the traditional criteria of academic excellence. I, as a professor, okay, when I served in the most powerful academic senate committee at my university one year, I go in there and there are a bunch of white guys there, Nobel Prize winners and all that. I was supposed to be intimidated, but I wasn't, you know. I was walking in there, you know. Uh, here I am, I'm going to give my wisdom to you guys, you know. And they, they look at me and say, what are you doing here? At first they thought I was the, the guy that was maybe going to deliver the coffee or something, I don't know. And they'd ask me, uh, what, uh, who, who are you? I mean, where are you from? And I said, what do you mean, where am I from? Yeah, what country are you from? Mexico, uh, where? No, no, I'm from this country, right here. This is my country. My ancestors were here before yours. Oh. And he said, what do you teach? Spanish, right? You teach in the Spanish department, right? I must teach. That's all I'm capable of because I speak Spanish, so therefore I have to teach Spanish. And I said, no, no. Spanish is my worst, was my worst subject in college. I couldn't get a a grade beyond a C, because the Spanish that I was being taught was not Mexican Spanish or even Boricua Spanish. It was Spain, Spain Spanish. Well, full throat things like, okay, you know, and I couldn't understand, and you know, what is she saying, the teacher, you know what I mean? I can't, is that Spanish? <laughs> My God, you know, I speak some Spanglish, you know, and uh, that's something different, you know, but anyway, that's another story. So again, uh, another battleground is ethnic studies. Now, I understand you got a little bit of that here on campus. Well, you should have more. You should have more. And even where we do have it, it's under attack by right wing uh, academics. Yeah, there, people say, wait a minute, this, this goes on in the academy? My God, it's all the objectivity? Aren't, aren't scholars supposed to be objective? No. Scholars are just like anybody else, you know? We put our pants on, we guys the same way, and dresses on and like other women, you know, we just, we're just human beings, you know, with biases and everything, we're all biased. There's no such thing as objectivity in the academy. Not even in science courses and laboratories, really. Because yeah, there might be a, under the microscope objectivity, whatever you're looking at, but who does the funding of most science programs and projects, research projects, huh? Corporations. Eh? And uh, so you got to look at that, those of you who are scientists, chemists, that I know some. Uh, you know, you have to look at that and look at it critically. What, is, what, am I, what am I doing here in my work that is good for mankind? And if something isn't good for mankind or womankind, then maybe you got to take a look at it and change it in your own industry or whatever and get organized to do that. And of course, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to do but I think it's important to try to do anyway. So we're under attack. We have been since we found ourselves because ethnic studies was born out of struggle. There is ethnic studies, Chicano, Latino studies, African American studies, Native American studies, Asian American studies, women's studies because of student struggles. There were student movements that demanded, demanded the creation of those programs, okay? That's what we have, not because the, the, the chancellors and the regents of institutions like these wanted them, they, because they were kind, because, they, yeah, we're going to give you this or you know, whatever. No, no. We went to battle. At my campus, it, it was a real battle because 
Even though it was a nonviolent protest, the police were, were not violent. I mean, nonviolent. They were violent. And to this day, when you look at, examine what's going on right now with protest actions uh, in terms of occupation movement, you've got to think about why is it that the nonviolent protesters are being arrested, but the criminals are not? The criminals are in the corporations and the banks and all that responsible for the problem. Why aren't they being arrested? Eh? But that raised that question. So right now there's a battle, but, but, but they hold back, the right-wingers. But they, do, they are attacking ethnic studies at the public school level in Arizona again. In Tucson, Tucson, Arizona school, public schools are the only ones in the whole country that have ethnic studies, Chicano studies, but not just like one course or two. They have a whole bunch of curricula. And kids are graduating because they, they learn about themselves, they learn about their history of their ancestors, they get, they're proud of who they are, and they develop critical thinking, and they learn about American history, they learn about politics, they, they learn about everything that the kids that are not in those programs don't learn. And they're going to college. So there's right-wing uh, politicians, beginning with the governor of Arizona all the way down, who have organized and paid, made a law against ethnic studies that's being fought right now in the courts. They want to do away with it. Why? According to them, because they advocate ethnic solidarity instead of treating people, individuals, as individuals. Wait a minute. Run that by me again? <laughs> or they foster anti-American attitude on the part of Mexican-American students in particular. Wow. The reality is that ethnic and, Ch and Chicano studies foster critical thinking in a curriculum that teaches the truth of American history and the contributions made by all people in our, in our society. So the problem with, with, uh, with that particular right-wing perspective, what I call the, uh, the cult of ethnicity perspective, is that it does promote ethnic and racial conflict. A lot of white folks who are ignorant to the reality fall, privy, or fall vulnerable, rather, to that particular politics. And, uh, and the reason that it's wrong, that perspective, was for the following two reasons. One, it fails to understand the multicultural and multiracial realities and complexity of contemporary society, the most obvious one. Number two, it fails to address the historical origin of those realities and that complexity. More specifically, it does not address the fact that America has never been a homogeneous nation rooted only on European cultures and values. It fails to address the historical fact that diversity has been an American reality long before the arrival of Europeans to this continent. Diversity and multiculturalism are authentically American in nature. The indigenous peoples of this part of the world were nations. They, had, they were distinct cultures and they had their own languages. There were all, over hundreds of them, okay? They were not all the same. They all didn't wear the same feathers and power and dance, you know, like they do in the movies, you know? They were all different. There was diversity was there from the very beginning. So what do we do in conclusion? What must we do? What must be done? Well, it's important for all of us to commit ourselves to a new politics that can build on the positives of the growing diversity, critical to develop amongst our young people in particular. You young people begin to think about becoming the leaders of the future with a new vision of the future based on those multiracial realities that I speak of and dedicated, like I said earlier, to building bridges uh, between different races and cultures. Okay, so what do we do? We gotta redefine diversity. We have to redefine diversity uh, from what it is today as a symbolic token kind of a thing today Okay, well, the, 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 ruling, the ruling people in the universities can brag about, oh yeah, we got X number of blacks and X number of Latinos and X number of Asians, you know, we're doing good. But we that are there are being programmed, are being prepared to go into the existing arrangements of power. Either you become a Democrat or a Republican, for example, or you become a corporate leader, you become the leader that is going to continue to perpetuate the problem. So we have, or you have in particular, because I've been there and done that, you have to get out of that box that you've been put into. 
The box is the problem. So you have to decide, am I going to be part of the problem? Or do I want to get out of that box into a new box that is the solution to the problem? Do I want to be part of the solution to the problem or part of the problem? That's what you have to decide individually. Okay? Uh, so, people of color, like President Obama, either have been used or they themselves allow themselves to be used as tokens, as, as symbols of a myth of democracy and equality in our society. So we need to understand that if the problem is this, the problem is a limited democracy that is run and controlled by a white patriarchy. Now, you happen to be a, a young white guy, don't take it personal. Again, it's not your fault, it's not your fault. It's those that came before you, way before you. And what I mean by that is that the dominant, all the dominant political and economic social institutions in our society are controlled by that patriarchy. And that patriarchy perpetuates uh, what I call uh, divide and conquer, divide and conquer techniques and strategies, okay? That perpetuate the class, racial, ethnic, gender, and sexuality divisions that keep our nation divided, okay? The patriarchy that controls the capitalist economy that we have and uh, uh, an economy which happens to be capitalism that is predicated on profit at the expense of human needs, okay? You gotta remember that, that's what capitalism is. So how do you go about giving the human face to capitalism? That is a challenge that we all have, individually and collectively. This particular patriarchy right now in power, the 1%, wages a foreign policy of war using our taxpaying money to pay for that war or those wars. And most tragically, exploits our youth, young men and women who should be here right now with the rest of you who are students instead of in Afghanistan, Iraq, and soon in Pakistan, and soon in Iran, and soon elsewhere. They become the cannon fodder to, uh, to the war and the ambition uh, those who rule to maintain this country as an empire to be feared in the world. So we must change that. So again, we need to redefine democracy in more revolutionary terms or in revolutionary terms. Now don't get scared. Revolution is okay. I mean, to talk about revolution. We did in the 60s, we made revolution. Revolution is like what the Hollywood movies pointed out to be that you see every day, you know, weapons and violence and this and that. We're talking about, as I happen to be the disi a disciple of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we're talking about a revolution of values, a nonviolent revolution of values. And we have to start with ourselves to change our values away from materialistic values to more spiritual, humanistic values. Spiritual beyond religion or church. Spiritual in terms of our love, okay? Not hate, but our love for each other, for people. Our, you know, there's too much hate in the world, you know? Love is for it's sad. We have to perpetuate and nurture that love that goes beyond just our immediate families as well, but that includes all the people that are the, hum the other humans that you, that you deal with in everyday life. So basically, the movement that you, your generation, the young people today in the audience, uh, will have to develop uh, must be built on those struggles that were positive of the 60s, the legacies, rather, of those struggles. The African-American Civil Rights Movement, the Chicano Movement, the Boricua Puerto Rican Movement, the Asian-American Movement, the American Indian Movement. But again, at the same time, we should not romanticize those movements, our movements. You know, you don't, it's okay to learn lessons from those movements that were not good lessons, okay? The good lessons were that we put our lives on the line for freedom, for equality, for social justice, for peace. Not that we're negatives there too, we must understand. And one of those is patriarchy of our cultures. We have patriarchal cultures, whether, whether we're white, black, brown, yeah, whatever, okay? And I speak of the baggage of those patriarchal cultures that, that contribute to sexism and homophobia, okay? 
Men and women have to understand that a commitment to struggle for a multiracial democracy also means that we must simultaneously wage struggle that I call the struggle of the internal revolution. It's very easy to say, oh yeah, let's get organized against Wall Street and all that. Cool. But you know what? If we don't change ourselves, if we don't decolonize our minds, eh, we won't make that revolution out there. What are we doing at home? You know, are we fostering gender equality at home? Are we, are we giving our love to those of us amongst us who are different, uh, specifically in sexuality terms? Are, are we, are we uh, doing things that, that will be uh, joyful as opposed to domestic violence, alcoholism, drug addiction, and all that? We have to be able to wage that internal struggle to change our values to those values that I speak of that we must fight for out there. So we must always look at the positives. Every culture that we represent has positives and negatives. The positives we must nurture. The negatives we must throw away. We must get rid of our bad baggage. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything in terms of changing our country for the better. So the challenge before us lies in the restructuring of these institutions like yours and mine, okay? And the restructuring of institutions out there as well. Yes, it's going to be a revolution. There's, the time has come for a revolution of values a peaceful, nonviolent revolution. And that is what scares the heck out of Wall Street and the presidency and the Congress. Even, the, even some Democrats are coming around to, to you know, saying good things about the occupation movement because they're scared. They don't want to be the enemy. They want to be, they want to be the good guys. Okay? So now, uh, I have sacrificed uh, gladly to make change, and I will continue to do that until I die. And there's been a dream that I had that has kept me going that I want to share with you tonight to offer to you as food for thought, okay? We had, well, we had good food. We had food tonight, real food, but I'm talking about food for thought for here in, in, in the mind, the intellectual, intellectual part of us, and here, and, and here in the heart, Hijole. That, that made the point. You, that, you, so, okay, now you know what I'm talking about, here in the heart. My dream is as follows, okay? This is my dream. My dream is that Americans of all colors, religions, sexual orientation, gender identities, men and women, the able and the disabled, will give birth to an authentic multiracial democracy. A democracy that will promote a true racial and ethnic diversity and equality in everyday life beyond symbolic tokenism. A democracy that honors its workers and values as equal all immigrant workers, whether they are documented or undocumented. A democracy that will promote social justice, economic and environmental justice, religious tolerance, nonviolence and peace at home and abroad. A democracy with a government that will include a representative of every diverse group at the table of political power on behalf of the people, not the military prison corporate complex. A democracy with a national multi-party system that where, where candidates for election include the poor and the working class, not just the 1% or even the middle class with an electoral system where every vote will in fact be counted. No more Floridas, no more Ohios, no more Bushes. A democracy where human needs are prioritized and not the needs of the rich and the corporations, where health care and education are defined as human rights. And finally, a democracy that prioritizes youth. Those of you here tonight, as the most important investment for the future of our nation, a nation that will build more schools instead of prisons. 
My democracy will take a long time to come true. I won't be around to witness it, but I will be with you in spirit when it does come. What I have learned in my lifetime, as you will learn, if not already, and that is that life is a struggle, and struggle is life. But that victory is in the struggle. Muchas gracias. Help me giving him another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Munoz, for your inspirational and thought-provoking speech and for joining us in celebrating the end of Latino Heritage Month. One more time, give him another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.